All right, guys, thanks for coming today. My name is Oz Campbell. I'm the CEO of uh, Rose AI, a company at the intersection of AI and finance. Uh, today, we're going to talk about decentralization versus centralization. I figure we have a nice group of decentralizers here. And basically, we're going to make the point that we're coming up on a little bit of a crossroads here in terms of the future. We're coming in terms of what kind of vision of the singularity you're going to get. You're going to get one that's either very decentralized or very centralized. And we're going to go through a bunch of different features of both of these systems and kind of talk about the pull to centralization, the pull towards, you know, hopefully uh, something we can resist a little bit, which is this, this effort to control and this effort to, um, you know, really get our hands around this thing. So two technologies for acceleration, crypto, new money machines, and uh, AI, new thinking machines. Uh, both of these have had their run over the last couple of years. You know, we see this everything on the blockchain theme that was a couple of years ago. Now everything is an LLM, which is today. Um, and what we, if you look at this, you kind of think, okay, well, what are the timelines we're going to get here? And, you know, more and more increasingly short timelines. If you look at, you know, prediction markets, we only have a couple of years, maybe three, before the robots wake up. If you're on Twitter, it's probably a couple of weeks. Um, and, and, the basic view amongst you know the doomer community or a lot of the AI community is that as soon as we get there, we're only eight months away from the robots being infinitely smarter than the humans, which is kind of scary if you're, you know, worried about robots. Um, and so the question then becomes, you know, what can these robots do? How much better can they be for humans? And in a lot of domains, they're actually already better than than humans. And so this is the question we're going to answer today. Um, so the questions we have from this are first. What kind of acceleration are we going to get? You know, which kind of outcome are we going to end up in? Um, how centralized is money, power, and tech going to be in that environment? And what can you and I do about that? So let's start with crypto. I'm not a crypto expert. You folks are a crypto expert. But, you know, we're going to talk about processing of data, DeFi versus central exchanges, users versus institutions, and anonymity versus KYC. Let's start with the Fedwire, right? So this is the origination of the Fed. Used to be you called up a, a, a bank office in Chicago and said, I want to wire money to, uh, to San Francisco. This is a pretty centralized system, right? And, and the goal of crypto, more or less, has been to use this idea of a decentralized processing machine to try to analyze something which is actually quite centralized, a, a ledger that's kind of public to everyone else. Um, the problem is that to actually <clears throat> access these systems, you end up with people who disagree about the state of the system. In particular, you end up with people who don't agree about things like what the market cap of the coins are. So what we have here, we'll have a couple slides here that go through the price, the market cap, and the tokens or the coins for a couple different, um, you know, a couple different cryptos. And what you'll see is that Coin Market Cap, Coin Gecko, Coin Metrics, Coin Codex, you know, a bunch of these folks don't agree. And so my company Rose, we do a lot of data work with financial institutions. And one of the things we've learned over the past is you just go and look at these things and add them up. And when you find that people disagree, one of the ways to solve this problem is to study it consistently in a, in a single place. And so, you know, a bunch of these, what you're going to see is there's ambiguity about not what the price is, but what the actual supply is. And this happens in a really big way in things like FTX, where there's a you know, question as to how much actually exists. But it's just ironic and interesting that in this decentralized approach, even though there's a centralized exchange, we don't really know what's going on. Okay? And so this is one of the problems that erupts when you engage in this kind of behavior is what is truth? How do I establish truth in this way where everything's all over the place, but I need a, a single source? Um, and so you know, one solution is a centralized exchange. One solution is <clears throat> to take the fact that it's... Uh, inefficient to clear all the transactions in a pure technology and to put it in a company, right? The, the kind of one-liner I, I have here is that, you know, crypto can be cool or crypto can be money, but it cannot be both. Your money should be boring. Your money should be, you know, something that's not interesting. And so when you see this effort to centralize in these big organizations, you have to ask yourself, well, what problem are they solving and how does that interact with the goals of crypto? Even more than that, the centralization around certain institutions as they deal with the constraints of compliance, as they deal with the constraints of security, you know, forgot passwords, all this kind of stuff. You see this tension, okay? This tension between the ability for everyone to access this system and the need for common interfaces and big institutions like the old guard. 
The, the most classic example of this is anonymity versus KYC, right? The goal was notionally everyone can engage with the financial system anonymously, and now we have a system where KYC is pushing out the need for all these institutions to go and validate who you are individually, which if you are a decentralist, should be a little bit, give you pause. So that's crypto in you know, 30 seconds. I'm gonna talk mostly about AI, but I want you to imagine that tension as we kind of go through the other facets here. And so what we're gonna talk about now is what is a much stronger impulse to centralize amongst AI? Much, much, much stronger, right? So you have this kind of decent centralization tendency in crypto, but what you have not only in AI is the economic need to centralize, but the political need to centralize, because we're scared of this technology, because we're worried about all the things that are gonna happen when it gets loose. And the only solution has to be centralization. And so I want you to worry about that like I do. Um, and so, you know, in, implicitly the question we're gonna ask is how strong slash bad are the increasing returns to scale in AI such that we have to use centralization to solve this problem, such that we have to control the technology? We're talking about data, matrices, capabilities, and danger. So let's start, and let me some charts, love charts, right? So centralization of, of, of processing versus data, right? AI, most of these models go out into the world and they look all across the universe for as much data as they can, but the problem is that to actually analyze that data is incredibly expensive in terms of time and human capital and energy. And to do that, right here we have the size of these models in different dimensions, right? The amount of data that's in them, massively more data, but when you actually look at what it takes to make them good, okay, what it takes to make them good, it's big models, which are expensive, and lots of human cleaning and lots of human um, fine tuning is what it's called. Lots of smart people looking at the outputs of these models and kind of tinkering with the machine. This forces that economy of scale, which centralizes it just naturally. So if you think about the deployment of these technologies, you have something that's actually pretty inherently decentralized, which is a model, right? You can give someone the weight to this model, you can put it on the internet, anyone can use it, oh my God, it's so decentralized. But when you actually think about the development of most consumer technologies, they orient themselves around a certain amount of common interfaces, right? Be it the newspaper, telephone, TV, personal computers, ISP, name your kind of technology wave. What you find is that at the outcome of this, you have a couple of big major incumbents that are kind of like an oligopoly that sit there and kind of control the ecosystem. And you see a lot of this with crypto as a result of the compute power and the memory size of these models meaning only the big boys can kind of play in this game now, and that means that you're gonna get more and more bigger companies, and that means that a couple of well-known names will come to dominate the space, right? OpenAI, famously not that open, famously kind of related to Microsoft now, and then a couple of these startups, which are you know, 200 million, 300 million, 500 million dollar Series A's. Why? Because we need to go train all this data. Well, that's gonna cut out the little man, that's gonna cut out, you know, mom and pop. And what does that mean from like an economic perspective? Well, it means that even though we have a radical decentralization of capabilities, everyone can potentially use these models, everyone can potentially access these models, you have this kind of classic oligopoly, classic monopoly system where high fixed costs, very, very, very low marginal costs mean one or two people at the end of the game win the game, a natural monopoly. And what happens when they automate all the jobs? So you see this in the outputs of the different manufacturing, of these technologies, whether it's chips, whether it's you know fabrication, in all aspects, the vertical kind of component of AI, you see the centralization impulse. And what's gonna happen? Well, depending on your timelines, a lot of jobs are gonna go away. This is a report from Goldman that suggests that about a quarter of the jobs are gonna be extraordinarily exposed to AI. You can make that up to 90% if you're a doomer, maybe 10% if you're not. There you go. So. What does it mean in terms of the outputs? Well, even though AI kind of makes the world flat because everyone has access to computing, everyone has access to decentralized intelligence, if you're like a Tom Friedmanist or whatever, you think, well, everyone has the access to create really bad you know, bioweapons. Everyone has the access to create really bad robots that go create all these you know, drones that are gonna get us. And so the solution has to be centralization. The solution has to be regulation. The solution has to be some bureaucratic, faceless institution that you don't know that makes you fill out a form and is gonna tell you how to live your life. I think that's kind of scary. Um, but the alternative from the doomers, right, is even scarier. 
they use this argument that we're all gonna die. We're all gonna die, right? If you're a Flight of the Concords fan, there's a great video, a little bit dated, the humans are dead, right? That these three things are gonna combine to kill us all. The increasing returns to scale for intelligence, what's called instrumental convergence, which is this buzzword for, you know, it's always better to have more power if you're a robot. And then any amount of misalignment will lead to kind of killer robots, right? And that this is an argument which you cannot deal with because if you kill all the humans, there's nothing worse than that, right? Killing all the humans is the worst outcome you can possibly have. And so we must fear the machine. And if you actually think about the concept of alignment, this is a chart which shows you know, where these models live on a political axis. There's no such thing as perfect alignment. There's no such thing as perfect alignment between you and me, between China and the US, between Europe, between France and Germany, right? If you, if you know a mathematician, you can think about Arrow's impossibility theorem, which says you can't get three people to do the same perfect ranked choice algorithm. And so there's no such thing as perfect alignment. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if we're scared and, and our bar is perfect alignment, then we must have control. We must have the ability to you know, prevent people from accessing these things. And when you hear the regulations that come out of this, they all sound similar, right? You need to have a license to use this stuff. We gotta have compute caps, don't let people touch it. We gotta regulate what you can do with this. You can't talk to it about you know, medicine. I asked a robot about my dog the other day, gave me really good advice because my vet wasn't around, but that's gonna be illegal, right? Domain restrictions. My preferred way of dealing with this, if we have to, is just keeping the existing legal framework of tort law, of accountability, of if you develop something that hurts somebody else, you're liable, and that you don't need as much centralization of control. But where is this all going? Where does it end? It ends with, you know, if you're familiar with like this little app, everyone has a UUID. This is where we are ending up, whether you want to or not. It doesn't have to necessarily be WorldCoin, it doesn't have to necessarily be this technology, but this ends in you having a UUID and the government knowing your UUID and you needing that UUID to interact with financial services, to interact with AI, to interact with transportation, if you're familiar with what's happening in China. This is what's happening. And so this, to me, on one degree is good because you know more efficiency, okay, I can access all these things easier and, and it's bad because I don't trust the people who are promising to align these machines. I don't trust the machines and government to tell me what I can and cannot do with my technology. So the alternative and something that will make you a little bit more optimistic, at least if you're thinking over even longer time frames, is why does anything not always get perfectly centralized? What is behind the role of, you know, the constraints of this system. How centralized can it be? And so let's make a little joke here and go back to the Holy Roman Empire and talk about you know King Charles. He had a pretty centralized uh, legacy, right? He had a pretty centralized genetic database. He was the product of a lot of different really fancy Habsburgs, right? I would argue that you know life finds a way. That if you over centralize these systems, they get brittle. If you over centralize these systems, they get inherently unable to deal with the real chaos of the universe. And you see this in real world data. You see this in the outputs of these big machines that have come in the past. And I'll give you two examples here. The first is a nice little chart here of 100 years of the Dow Jones. And what you see is that there's no such thing as a perfect monopoly over long periods of time. They, all companies die eventually. All companies leave the S&P 500, all, you know, companies eventually run into constraints. And that when you think about that relating to these other ideas, that when you over-centralize, sometimes bad things happen, right? Sometimes you get the kind of classic problems with over-centralization, like Mr. Charles's jaw, um, like his, you know, his ability to reason. And then that destabilizes the centralized system. That destabilizes what seems to have no limit to its control, no limit to its power, right? That in essence, you know, even reserve currencies, even empires, all these things eventually die. And they eventually die because the world evolves consistent with decentralization. The world evolves consistent with creativity. The world evolves in a way where you are not strictly dominant by centralization. And so when you think about that in the context of AI and you think about that in the context of crypto, that crypto provides a nice, buttress against this kind of effort from these people to centralize everything in your life and everything in the market. So thank you very much.